Today's session on inclusive business and food security will look at two key questions. Why is everybody interested, increasingly interested in inclusive business? And what is it? And if you get it right, what benefits can be reaped from it? If we look at poverty worldwide, then globally the most food insecure and the most impoverished people live in rural communities. And that situation is set to continue in the future. At the same time, agriculture, which is the primary activity in, in rural areas, is a proven highly effective path for getting out of poverty situations. That does require a different way of producing and linking to markets. Through inclusive business, we try to enhance that process by creating rural jobs more effectively, supporting local enterprises, and sourcing from smallholders in such a way that it's beneficial for the rural community. The impacts that can be achieved lead to greater stability in the business relationship and the value chain. It lowers the risks for all of those involved. And it can enhance both productivity and profitability, therefore making the whole business model a much more viable and appealing one. At the same time, inclusive business is also about involving different parties that are normally ignored, the marginalized groups of women and youth who play an important role in agricultural activities but don't have much less influence on the rewards that come out of agriculture. Overall, inclusive business is about deciding who do you include, in what way of sharing the risks involved with agriculture, the resources that you can invest collectively to make it productive and profitable, and the rewards that do come out of good agriculture. Over the years, the definition and the focus of inclusive business has shifted from being essentially a poverty allevi alleviation uh, activity to being a business initiative with a social impact dimension. The definition that we use increasingly today includes four key elements. It is a business initiative. Therefore, there has to be a business model and has to make business sense. And it is about the company's core process. It's not about a corporate social responsible activity attached or tagged on to normal business processes, but it is about fundamentally rethinking the way you do business. The third dimension is about who you involve, as we've, as we've mentioned. Giving low-income and disempowered populations an explicit profitable and attractive role in a value chain and doing so in such a way that everybody clearly benefits from that relationships being explicit about who what incentives there are for everybody to be involved in the inclusive business if we look at companies perspective of why to be involved with, with uh, inclusive business we can make a slight distinction between lead firms and SMEs, but essentially they look at three dimensions. The first part is very much about securing supply. As we move into a world which requires increasingly amounts, increasing amounts of food and different kinds of food, there's increasing pressure on securing your long-term supply. This, this applies for all SMEs. Changing your relationship with your suppliers, the producers, can lead to a more secure and stable supply base to the future. The second part is your relationship to the community or to the region in which you're working, your reputation there. As we move into a more transparent world, people can no longer do, businesses cannot do business in any way they'd like, but they have to be justify the way that they actually interact with those involved in their value chain. The third part of it is looking to the opportunity. If we look at global populations of very low and low income populations, four and a half billion people, there's increasing awareness that collectively they form a massive market. However, it does require a different way of interacting with that market and ensuring that the products and the availability of those products are organized to make that market a potential a serious business proposition. So, if we do get inclusive business right, what can you achieve? 
Well, you can turn farmers and producer organizations into viable business partners and appealing business partners. That leads, gives them future opportunities to respond to emerging opportunities and it gives you a solid business relationship if you're a business. It's also about uh, making sure that different kinds of products are available to a much wider group of population, such as fortified foods available to um, communities and, and particular population groups who need that in an affordable way. And it's about making sure that you set up proper governance structures which structurally include people who normally don't have a voice and can influence decisions in the business model. If we look at it from a perspective of the way that a normal product is built up, the whole focus of inclusive business is about drawing in those who are m more at the base of the pyramid, who are focused on subsistence, who are, or who are not able to structurally benefit from good market relationships, investing in them so that they are increasingly able to benefit from, from proper business relationship, and on the other side, encouraging companies to take greater risk and rethink their business models so that they work with different uh, population groups and have a greater and wider social impact. Inclusive business includes six key principles that have emerged over experience. So you can design deliberately and you can assess deliberately whether an inclusive business is inclusive or whether it's just business as usual. The first one is about chain-wide collaboration. Who are you involving in what kind of a way Norm that goes beyond simply the buyer and the seller? The second dimension is about creating market opportunities and linkages so that there is a choice being developed and you don't, you don't create only monopoly situations. The third is the governance aspect, which I've already mentioned. The fourth principle of inclusive business is about investing resources in such a way that a wider group of, of people has access to the necessary services and inputs that makes profitable and uh, reliable production possible. The last two dimensions are about formulating where do we go collectively and are we actually making progress as, we've, as we have agreed. If we look at a typical value chain, the actual activities that are involved are the ones indicated in this slide. Downstream, they're very much about adapting the way and changing the way that you do trade, the terms of trade. And upstream, it's about investing in the ability to produce reliably and safely. A case that illustrates this is the collaboration between Ecom, a large global coffee trader, with Hivos and NGO in East Africa, where Ecom was noticing that the supply of coffee that they were able to source was declining rapidly. Why? Because of global coffee prices, suppliers were less interested in, in uh, producers were less interested in focusing on their coffee, and Ecom had less to trade. This led to a completely rethink of the way that they interacted with their suppliers, and they therefore created a farmer support service embedded in their marketing and trading relationship, which is focused on, on supporting the entire coffee-based farming system, not just only the coffee production, but also other activities, making sure that women and youth are active economic actors in this process. And it now works with over 100,000 farmers in East Africa and leading, is leading to significant improvement. If you should want to know more about this, one of the areas you could look at is the Seas of Change Network a network focusing very much about scaling inclusive agri-food markets.